Welcome back to the Gower Crowd podcast. Lots of activity again in the markets this week with Reuters headlines this morning announcing as follows. Invasion and inversion shaking world order. In fact, they go on to say that, and I quote, investors had hoped 2022 would be the year when the market recovery from COVID-19 finally got cemented and life started to feel a little more normal. Boy, were they wrong. Close quotes. Now, as you know, I normally prefer to do evergreen podcasts that you can listen to at any time and have them still relevant. But with as much as is going on in the market, we all want to be able to create some kind of sense out of the turmoil. And my guest today, Mark Hamrick, is the man to do that. Mark is Washington Bureau Chief, Senior Economic Analyst of Bankrate.com and Senior Director at Parent Red Ventures. Now, just to put who he is and who Bankrate.com is into perspective, we use an SEO tool that shows us how many people visit sites. And on a good day, the traffic value, just to put this into perspective, for Gower Crowd can get up to around $30,000 a month. That means that the amount of organic traffic we get, we would have to pay $30,000 a month in paid advertising to get the same kind of organic traffic. Bankrate.com's traffic value, I've never seen anything like this, 49.8 million. It's like, it's completely out of control. I've never seen anything like it. This is one of the top 2,000 websites in the world. So you're going to be getting an extremely authoritative view from Mark today. To find out more about Mark and bankrate.com and see the video shorts from today's episode where you can get sound bites from what we discuss, go to the podcast page at gowercrowd.com. While you're there, be sure to subscribe to the Gower Crowd newsletter. As you know, we have the only news channel that is exclusively dedicated to real estate crowdfunding and syndication, where you can find news and education about real estate syndication and access, gain access to every single syndicated real estate deal on the market. It's all there at gowercrowd.com. Be sure to subscribe and get our Wednesday newsletter. It's absolutely free. Right, on to my guest today. My pleasure to introduce you to one of the leading journalists at one of the leading financial sites in the world, Mark Hamrick, Washington Bureau Chief and Senior Economic Analyst at Bankrate.com. Mark, thank you so much for joining me. I'm so grateful to Steve for the introduction. Let me start off by asking you actually, before we dive into the economics, I'm interested to know actually your role. But before we start that, what is the mission of Bankrate? Let's start then. Let's dive then into your role. Yeah, thanks for having me, Adam. I really appreciate it. And uh, well, first of all, Bankrate, which is primarily thought of as an internet site, uh, began long before the internet um, in 1976, uh, originally founded in Palm Beach, uh, West Palm Beach, Florida, uh, and is now part of a larger uh, digital media company, Red Ventures. So we were acquired a number of years ago, and our family of companies at Red Ventures includes CNET, Healthline, Health Grades, The Points Guy, a lot of digital brands that people are very familiar with. But back to the point about bank rate, uh, we began really uh, a remarkable mission. Uh, if you think about the fact that it, it began at a time when the internet was not yet uh, in its current form, and that was surveying across the breadth of the interest rate landscape specific to geography. And back in those days, and I was working at Associated Press and in, in here in Washington when I first became familiar with it as business news leader for broadcast. And we would get faxes with the top uh, <laughs> rates for certificates of deposit uh, generated by bank rate. And uh, we use that in our content and our, our broadcast. And so when the internet presented itself, it was the perfect distribution mechanism for very specific information, whether somebody is trying to find an auto loan, a certificate of deposit, a high yield checking account, a mortgage rate. And so we're a free site. We're a very trusted site and have been so uh, ever since we went into business. And to my role, and thanks for the questions, 
uh, to sort of define those things. Uh, I'm trained as a journalist, uh, trained essentially as a financial and economic journalist. I've been doing that uh, specifically uh, in terms of business and the economy for about three decades. And my role at Bankrate as senior economic analyst and Washington bureau chief is to really try to connect the dots between what's happening in the economy and with Americans personal finances. And we do a lot of proprietary surveys. Uh, I am among those that take the lead on uh, coming up with the concepts for those, uh, aside from the rate surveys that we do uh, essentially on autopilot across the landscape, across the economy. And so I'll just give it an example. Uh, okay. We're speaking, of course, uh, toward the end of March in 2022, because digital content resides uh, forever. And uh, we just conducted a survey and had a big media tour associated with that, that found that 51% of those Americans who are in the workforce intend to look for a new job in the next 12 months. And we found that they're prioritizing flexibility uh, defined as either the opportunity to work remote or from home or hours uh, that are flexible. They're prioritizing that over compensation. And so uh, we came up with the idea for that survey. Uh, we work with uh, credible uh, survey entities to uh, survey the American public so that we can have a good representation uh, that sort of tells us what is going on with the American mindset. And then uh, it's my job to work with our own editorial team at Bankrate to create content around that, but also I do hundreds of media interviews every year with our friends in the news media uh, that uh, are interested in, again, connecting the dots between what's going on in the economy and financial markets uh, and Americans' personal financial lives. So to me, it's a perfect job for me because uh, I, it's always changing. Uh, it's uh, endlessly fascinating. And you know we have access to the smartest minds on the face of the planet when it comes to trying to translate these things. And so I get to work with people like you uh, to connect to people on the other side of the camera or the microphone or the keyboard and, and try to make some sense out of what's going on. It's not always easy. Maybe we don't always succeed in making good sense out of things. Sometimes, you know, you can't rationalize that, which is not rational, but uh, but that's among the things that I love about the opportunity I have at bank rate and with Red Ventures. So this is very interesting that you talk about job mig migration and people looking for flexibility. And presumably that implies the ability to be able to work remotely, right? Not being stuck to one location, actually even having a commute for heaven's sake. Yeah. But there's this, uh, there's all kinds of things going on in the economy. First of all, we've got maximum employment. What is it? Since 1969, we've never had such high employment. Record job quitting rates, mm -hmm. right? People are moving a lot. So it's not just the next year, 51%. It's actually happening now. What is the impact of this? I mean, is this, what, what's going on in America? Are people moving? Are we seeing people migrating physically around the country and are, are big cities gonna, you know, like what's happening, Mark? What are you seeing in terms of the actual impact? Well, I don't know exactly what the location is where where you're working or speaking to me right now. I know uh, you're in Southern California and, and one of the nicer areas of the world to be in in Southern California. Uh, as, as you might be able to see, this is a legit home that I'm sitting in, it happens right. to be mine, the one I share with my wife, in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. And we do have an office in downtown Washington, D.C., but I am not there today. And I most days I am not because, frankly, uh, the uh, central business district of Washington, D.C. is very uh, sparsely attended these days. And I know that gets uh, very close to uh, the subject that uh, you're most uh, uh, engaged in, and that's commercial real estate. And so um, as Americans prioritize as workers, this notion of essentially comfort, uh, the opportunity to work from home, to be able to throw a load of laundry in while working on a Word document and answering email, or maybe you know taking their uh, mobile phone to the uh, washing machine while they're doing that, uh, and also trying to forego uh, the time and expense of commuting at a time when we essentially have record high gasoline prices in the United right. States. So obviously has immense implications. I mean, we could probably speak for 24 hours straight if we had sufficient caffeine about the implications <laughs> of, of, uh, of these changes. So um, 
you're you're very spot on with the recitation of some of the data points there and you know whether it's uh, the latest so-called job openings and labor turnover survey that we get from the labor department a little lagged uh usually about two months behind or the monthly employment report that we're bracing for as we speak uh for the month of march but is expected to again be strong and you're absolutely right to dial in on the notion that we could be very close to full employment is funny. I was listening to a piece that I had done about the Fed about 20, 25 years ago, uh, right about the time that, uh, as I as I recall, the timing might be a little bit off, but it, it was basically from the transition from Greenspan to Bernanke. And uh, again, uh, people were trying to get their arms around, you know, what is maximum employment, essentially what is full employment, what is the point at which essentially you can't or don't go any lower uh, with respect to unemployment and by extension don't go any higher with, with employment. And then from that comes another critically uh, important question, and that is what is the neutral rate for the federal funds rate that the Federal Reserve uses as sort of its uh, manual um, gear shift in, in trying to get the economy at something along the lines of equilibrium, which at this point would be akin to a prayer. So, uh, so all those things are very complicated, and uh, and you know we are speaking at a time of immense complication with respect to not only uh, the economy and financial markets, but obviously geopolitical concerns uh, because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And that doesn't even take into consideration the complications of so many other countries around the world. And, you know, you think, Adam, about the fact that here we are talking about essentially where we sit, uh, sort of figuratively speaking, and maybe literally as well. And it's almost as if a pandemic, which is still in effect, is still occurring, has essentially dropped off the front page of the printed newspaper, uh, giving way to the subject matter about Russia, Ukraine, and of course, inflation, which is top of mind for, for all consumers. So uh, be careful what you wish for when you want times to be exciting, because they're very exciting. Unfortunately, many of the forces that we're dealing with uh, have some negative uh, implications as well. Yeah. And now you've been in this for a long time. You said the bank rate has been around for 1970, yeah. since 1976. Yeah. I'm not going to assume that you have because you don't look remotely close to being possibly that old. But you have talked about faxes. So you definitely go back a long time, seeing a lot of cycles. Full transparency, I'm 61 years old. There you go. <laughs> okay. You, you don't look it. You're very you might kind. have done Text 10 years ago. But Text you're... in the mail. <laughs> uh, um, so you've seen a lot of cycles, right? You saw the savings and loan crash. Mm -hmm. You saw yes. the dot com. You saw the 2007. There have been some big cycles in your time. And one oh, yeah. of the classic, classic, most wonderful expressions that we hear in real estate, the more you hear it, you, the more you know that it's time to start tightening your seatbelts. No. This time is different. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. my question is, you know, you've seen the 70s, 80s, 90s, and the 2000s. Is this time different? Is it different? Like, what's what's different about what's going on in the world today in comparison to what you've seen in a way that we can maybe understand what's headed towards us? And, you know, some of your uh, wise viewers and or listeners may be able to dial in precisely on what one of the negative consequences of that pre preaching from that this time is different hymnal, right, which is to say, don't worry about the things that you think should go wrong from the current situation, because this time is different. Those things which we may have as a nagging fear in our minds could not possibly happen. So, so, something like inflation, for example, right? So, I mean, uh, as I mean, I've been going to Federal Reserve news conferences since the news conferences began, which in the, you know, in the sort of uh, historic timelines, not that long. They began in 2011 uh, and, uh, and that was under Bernanke and then we had Yellen and now we have uh, Powell, of course. And the reason why I just wanna dial in on that specifically is because the Federal Reserve, as we all know, has a dual mandate. 
uh, in a way, it has a, a tertiary mandate as well, or a third part, which is financial stability. But the main two parts of that would be scale, which is never in perfect balance, is maximum employment and stable prices. Mm -hmm. And you know, we came out of the last expansion with an unemployment rate that went as low as three and a half percent, and the Fed year after year after year had failed to achieve its objective or did not see the objective reached of essentially 2% annualized inflation. And so I'm of the belief that there was a mindset that had essentially taken hold among most members of the, let's just say the Federal Reserve Board or the Federal Open Market Committee, that truly believed that inflation had become an antiquated threat. In other words, it was not going to happen again. And of course, the constellation and convergence of the things that created the current circumstances could legitimately be argued to have been totally unforeseen, right? I mean, who had it on their bingo card that there'd be a pandemic <laughs> That would cause supply chain disruptions that were followed by an invasion of Ukraine, which is a major, you know, supplier in concert with Russia of such things as metals and wheat. Uh, who had that on? Who had all those things on their bingo card? And then that, you know, as we speak, we, we're probably bracing for eight percent plus year over year annualized inflation at the consumer level. So, you know, every second that we breathe, thank goodness we'll be experiencing something that is different, but there are always the, the notions that history may not repeat itself, but it very does often rhyme. And, and so what rhymes with the past now is that it was OPEC that helped to generate historically high inflation many years ago. Uh, and uh, now it's OPEC plus, it's not just the so-called Arab oil cartel and OPEC plus includes Russia, uh, but it could well be that uh, essentially limited supply of crude, et cetera, uh, can legitimately be cited as uh, one of the uh, vectors or triggers for this next round or the latest round of inflation. So I would say that you know we should be mindful of history. We should try to be as aware of history as we can be. But to go to the earlier point about the Federal Reserve, um, you know, reporters have asked Chairman Powell essentially, you know, did you take your eye off the ball? Was there too much stimulus in the economy, which is you know occurs at both the elected official level, you know, presidents and, uh, and and members of Congress, as well as the monetary piece, which is central banks. And his answer to that is, let's let the historians judge that. But I think that if they if somebody gave them a do over, uh, I think they would have reduced asset purchases much earlier because they just ended those asset purchases in total uh, here in the month of March of 2022. Uh, and they've only essentially pulled the trigger once uh, on the federal federal funds rate hiking cycle. And, and we'll not, we don't have a legitimate way of knowing how far they get up on that uh, staircase, but it's a good bet right now that that they're going to be going, you know, they're going to be stepping up quite a bit. And, uh, and, and so had they been more responsive or more aggressive in their uh, tightening a monetary policy earlier, it's possible that we wouldn't have experienced this outsized inflation. Of course, the other part is just to wrap that up. Federal Reserve doesn't have a tool in its toolbox to hire tens of thousands of truck drivers or uh, individuals to unload the containers that are uh, on ships not too far from where you're seated uh, off the West Coast, doesn't have the tools to pump uh, more crude oil or even to resolve those supply and supply chain uh, disruptions that are occurring across Russia and Ukraine. And certainly can't resolve the fear that exists out there that's also informing financial markets about the concern that you know this could get worse before it gets better with respect to uh, access to supplies. Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? I mean, you've got uh, this conf confluence of inflation and now rising interest rates. And I, you know, I remember when I was first in the states in the 1980s, early 80s, and it was. I remember mortgage rates at 16 percent. Yes, you got 12 percent on deposit at the bank. It, it, was, it was a different era altogether. And I'm not saying that's where we're headed, but with the tension that uh, people are sensing, certainly in the market about inflation. 
and the anticipation of some fairly steep interest rate hikes. It's you know, cl clearly anything, you know, 200 basis points and up really, even for just this, I mean, it's significant. You know, in the early 80s, it would mean nothing, right? It's like, it's like a blip. Right. Yeah. But it's, we're talking about doubling rates at the moment. Right. Are you seeing from your, from your surveys and from, even from anecdotally or from your research, are you sending any indications of how consumers are reacting uh, in terms of their borrowing or their, their, their finances in general? Uh, absolutely. Whether it's a, a recent survey that we've done of, of consumers or essentially individuals uh, or anecdotally, uh, it's obviously having an impact and, and, and it, it weighs most heavily on the consumer psyche. So uh, one thing I, I've been thinking about in recent days is with gasoline prices as high as they are, and that tends to be something that people complain about first <laughs> when that occurs is like- Gasoline, you know, gasoline yeah, prices. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the price of gas. No, I'm actually, as you know, I'm in LA, I've seen $7 gas. Oh, I know. Yeah, right in Beverly Hills there. It's I've, crazy, yeah, it's yeah. $7. I didn't know you could have full service gasoline stations, but I know they still exist and not too far from where you are. Right. Um, but, you know, we're talking about buying something that nobody really wants to have to buy. And, and when they do purchase it, it ends up essentially going up in the equivalent or, or the or the actual uh, going up in smoke. Um, and so uh, coming into this, if you want to call it a current crisis, the good news is that American households and their balance sheets have been in the best shape that they've been in quite some time, in part because of all the things that were done to keep them whole, whether it's something like um, you know mortgage forbearance or the child tax credit that expired as of the uh, end of last year. Uh, and so uh, the Amer Americans' savings have been, uh, I would say, uh, elevated, but we could quickly see that being drawn down because, uh, because you're having to pay so much for, for so many different things. Uh, and obviously those at the lower end of the wage and um, well, spectrums are, are you know very much at risk, but but those in the middle class are very much at risk as well. So it's going to be key to watch things like um, actual spending, uh, retail sales in the coming months, mm -hmm. uh, and you know I, I would expect that at least for the next two months, measures of inflation are truly going to be. Um, stunning <laughs> to, to say the least do you really and uh, when you say, you think inflation is going to we're going to see it spike even further yeah i mean we have to because uh the consumer price index was most recently put at a year over year increase of, of 7.9 percent which was uh essentially uh for the month of february and uh since then we've we've only seen uh these prices go higher so that doesn't mean that that has to be sustained over a long period of time, but uh, it's making, if, if, if it is not sustained, if we actually have some uh, pullback in inflation or retracement of those numbers, it's going to make for quite the dramatic uh, closing act. <laughs> so, um, uh, so it, you know, it is something to watch. And, well, hang and on, just explain that a little bit. So, so we, yeah. we're talking about kind of a peaking Yes. and then a sudden drop off. What's if, if, the yeah. implications of that, if that's why, if this is yeah. actually transitory? Yeah, well, I mean, everything's transitory, right? I mean, uh, that, that, you know, 90 plus percent of all humans that have been alive are, are no longer. But, uh, <laughs> but um, first of all, I mean, you're gonna, ha for, for it to persist for a very long time, uh, assuming that you accept the notion that it hasn't already, you would have to have a, a, a continuing mismatch of demand and supply, right? And we've seen it time and time again, uh, we just don't know exactly how long the cycle takes for those things to resolve themselves, right? So we presume that Shanghai, et cetera, will not be on lockdown forever. We presume that the lack of availability of semiconductors uh, will not persist forever. We presume that the escalation in home prices 
can't continue, you know, on an annual basis the way that has been occurring simply because you can, you know, if you're having double digit percentage increases year after year, at some point, there's a disconnect between the upper, the ability for home buyers to pay those prices and, and what the prices actually are. Uh, and the same goes for automobiles with the used and new car prices having, you know, mm-hmm. risen in, in ways that I, you know, I've never seen before and, and would have never been able to forecast. So I just think over time, those things Things do have to align, it, it, and it's not going to happen all at once. But in the meantime, Russia invaded Ukraine, right. and that has had immense implications on all kinds of prices, everything from nickel to palladium used to make catalytic converters to excuse our use of fossil fruit, uh, fuels and automobiles, uh, as well as obviously uh, everything we eat and, 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 uh, and, and the gasoline that creates uh, that pollution. So, you know, I would say, let's see what happens with March and April is probably going to be ugly with the measures of uh, inflation. Uh, and then we'll watch the producer price index as well, because obviously that's the wholesale gauge. And if we begin to see that just kind of simmer a little bit, maybe come off full boil, uh, maybe then we'll get at least, you know, some some better readings on things at the consumer level or the uh, uh, other measures of inflation. And obviously, once you get into the second half of the year, you're also going to have um, more forgiving year over year uh, comparisons. Uh, and, uh, and that may you know, again, take some of the tension out of that. But uh, yeah, I mean, clearly consumer confidence is at the worst we've seen in uh, many years. And is some it, of the, yeah, that yeah. Was oh, actually, you actually dovetail straight to my next question. Yeah, so, yeah. So in consumer sentiment, people are pessimistic at the moment. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's quite remarkable because if you, if you go back to that balance between employment and inflation, mm. essentially, despite the fact that we talked about the great resignation or the great migration, which is the movement of workers, people are looking past all that in terms of what we're seeing in the survey data. In in other words, they're not excusing inflation because of a strong job market. They're saying this inflation is real. And you can kind of understand that from the vantage point of uh, we've checked the full employment or nearly full employment box off. Uh, people are going to continue to strive for improvement in their employment where they're uh, inclined to do that, uh, including with wage increases. But the sort of problem at hand is, you know, what you just expressed, ex- you know, ex- expressing surprise and shock at some of the things that you see out there. You know, I, I had I've had those experiences myself where, you know, I saw how much gasoline costs and and I, and I sort of you know murmur to myself about that we live in the state of Maryland there was a time uh over the summer or, or spring when the price of crab meat just totally spiked and I was like I took it off the uh off the menu as the cook and bottle washer around here is like <laughs> we're not doing crab cakes I'm not you doing back to, you have back to can, can beans for dinner every night like, well you know uh <laughs> I've done it before. I can do it again. But uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I th- so we haven't seen a collapse in in essentially the consumer uh, response in the sense of what they're buying. But as you know, b- being dialed into real estate, you know, with uh, 30 year fixed rate mortgages having popped above five percent in recent days, uh, those in the um, residential real estate business are, are quite concerned that we that they may we may see you know, even a double digit decline in sales uh, at some point down the road. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, it is actually. So this was actually my question. So con- consumer sentiment, negative. Yes. People are physically migrating, right? It's not just they look at their quitting jobs and moving physically. So you get this sense of incredible motion, right? Physically in the in the economy. Do you think this is the thought? I've, do you think people are moving so fast and trying to change stuff and resettle before the music stops? Is that the sentiment you think that's in the market? Or uh, I'm, I'm sure there are some, but you know what? My colleague Greg McBride, who's been with Bankrate much longer than I have, and is sort of our uh, our um, Tom Brady of Bankrate, if you will, um, came up with a phrase that I love, and that is. Uh, People don't get married just because wedding dresses go on sale, right? Or for sale. In other words, marked down. And and so, 
you know, there are going to be people that just need to live their lives no matter what. And I think about my many younger colleagues and friends who, you know, absolutely moved at some point during the pandemic, whether it was an apartment or picked up from the New York City area and went somewhere else because it was felt claustrophobic and dangerous, you know, uh, being in that population center. Um, but the other part is as an economic judgment, right? In other words, let's say someone is happy with the employment they have and they have the opportunity to work remote and they also seize upon the opportunity to, to move to the Columbus, Ohio or Tulsa, Oklahoma kind of community where it might be less traffic, sort of less hassle for lack of a better way of putting it and a much better entry point for home purchase. So uh, I think that's one of the marvelous things about what's happened, right? I mean, uh, we didn't wish a pandemic upon ourselves by any stretch of the imagination, but we've learned to use tools like we are right now that we didn't know we had available. Certainly if it had been 9-11, we had to do this. We couldn't have done what we've done. Um, and, and there is this awareness, by the way, on the part of agile, and I would say aware employers and enterprises that if they can, they have to acknowledge that there's no going back to the way things were before. And much the same as those who survived uh, through the Great Depression will have had their lives permanently changed by this experience. I'm just speaking about the pandemic. So, you know, there was massive distrust of banks because banks were failing all over the place. And that brought a, a lot of reform, including the protection of, uh, of uh, Sabre's uh, bank balances, uh, as well as other uh, changes under FDR, et cetera. Uh, and I don't think we'll have the regulatory changes in the environment, but essentially, these changes are structural that are occurring, right? Because people are recognizing, well, if you don't allow me to work from home, I'll find somebody who does. And I just had this experience in the last week where I went to my doctor's office for a regular checkup. I won't say who the doctor is because I don't want to call out the staffer uh, who was a you know very professional young woman and all that. And, and I'm, you know, a sort of a curious person by nature. And I said, you know, how do you like what you're doing? And how long have you been doing it? And she was probably in her 20s. And she said, I love my work, but I want to work from remote from now on. She was a, a technician in the doctor's office. And I thought, there you go. And, and so those people who have to work in public or in public facing jobs, I think have a sense that there's a trade off from that, unless they just absolutely love it. And if they have to make that trade off, then they're going to say, okay, I know I can't bring dishes to the table from the kitchen in this restaurant from my home, but I would like you to pay me or give me more flexible hours. And so I think with all that we've been pained by the pandemic, whether it's the loss of life or sacrifice or all those things, or just a sense of, you know, lives are a risk, stress, uh, we've been able to have a remarkable amount of innovation. And, and those innovations are gonna foster and have fostered uh, great productivity improvements, learning, higher uh, awareness of the need to be attentive to mental health, uh, and enterprises have to be attentive to those things. Employers have to be attentive to those things. So these are all changes which could have never occurred had it not been for this. Well, it's interesting to say never occurred. My sense of it is that it's just accelerated existing right. trends, basically. I mean, it would have happened, but it would have taken longer. This has just kind of whipped it up and forced people to work Absolutely. remotely. And suddenly you realize, well, what the heck? <laughs> Am I yeah. commuting yeah. anymore? Yeah, no, absolutely. But I mean, you know, some of the more conservative uh, employers out in the world, and obviously it's not a political statement, I'm talking about their way of approaching the work, have now recognized that, you know, You've got to you've got to sort of relax and trust people to the degree that you can do that. And you can measure their performance, and that's appropriate and and more appropriate in some settings than others. But um, you know, we don't have a highly unionized workforce in this country, and 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 it may be true that that ship has sailed. Uh, but there's other ways that workers can take control or seize upon mm -hmm. opportunity and power. And, and, and they're doing that. And obviously we see the sort of one-offs with Starbucks or the attempts to unionize mm -hmm. at Amazon, apparently so, so far unsuccessfully, but workers have other ways of trying to drive, you know, the process.
Uh, this is uh, kind of the last question before my last questions, but it makes me wonder, have you, have you ever looked at the inclination for people to become increasingly entrepreneurial? And the reason that I ask that is the idea that if we're working from home and we've got this high inflation, that, it, that you, can, you can deliver to one job more efficiently, but you can also get and earn money through side gigs. And yeah. that also inspires entrepreneurialism. Could, like, are you yeah. seeing anything like that? Uh, in your I think business? it'll be a while before we have good data on that. And we have measured that over the years. And, uh, you know, absolutely, that has been a trend. Uh, and I think that it may show up. In other words, I'm saying there's a, there's a chance that it may show up in, in the future when we get a better look uh, or get our arms around the changes that have occurred that I, I think that some people who've exited the workforce, meaning they're no longer counted as those who are working or looking for work, mm -hmm. have gone into business for themselves at home. And why not, right? Because, you know, we have uh, this amazing logistics economy now where it's, you know, so much easier to get things from at least when the, everything's working from point A to point B. Obviously, that's a way where you can own the amount of time that you're willing to work and and sort of set the boundaries in 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 your own home as to how you're going to work and the conditions for that uh, and the other part is that uh, some of the figures that we have on essentially births and deaths of establishments as the government calls those data sets those tend to be very lagging so we don't we don't have sort of a good measure of that in real time but Adam wouldn't it be wonderful if indeed that were to have been one of the positive consequences of this experience because we know that that's how tremendous innovation and ultimately employment gains can occur is by the formation of small businesses and we can think about the legends of the likes of jeff bezos or steve jobs exactly. starting from their garage i guess you have to have a garage to have that, I never, I never hear it from the the family room or the bedroom. Well, I don't know the basement. You know, yeah, well, there you go. Guys yeah. are like buried in their basement. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Mark, let me ask you. So this is a little bit of an unfair question. I'm actually, okay. I'm actually going to. Uh, I noticed your Twitter handle. Yeah. So maybe there is something there, and maybe there isn't. But if there are any hamrickisms. <laughs> What are they? What are, can you tell me some hamrickisms? Like, by the way, for, for just FYI, at hamrickism, Thank right? You. Yeah, yeah, yeah is your Twitter handle. So yeah. any hamrickisms that we should Well, I mean, uh, you know, my family uh, is, is probably ready for me to retire on the, you know, dad jokes punchline. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but, you know, I mean, the old, the, the, the longest running joke that we we had as business journalists along those lines was, of course, to buy low, sell high, right? And so, you know, that's still, that's still good advice. But, but to bring it around for something that's truly, I think, ultimately useful for people. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, my son, who's now 30 and doing wonderful things not far from where you are in Southern California, has, has teased me about the fact that, you know, I'm sort of saying, save your money. But if we go to the bank rate data, our, our uh, surveys just time and time again, find that the number one financial regret on the part of Americans is really one of two things or mm. could be combined. And that is the failure to save for emergencies and the failure to save for retirement. And so if people can recognize that they don't want to be on the um, the remorseful side of, of that response, the way to do that, and I know it's not easy for everybody any of those things is to try to save more than you think you're going to need. Because Adam, I have yet to meet the person who said, you know what? I saved too much for emergencies. I saved too <laughs> much for retirement. I haven't met that person yet. Yeah. And so, you know, we don't have a great social safety net in our country. We demonstrated that over the last 24 plus months, although I would say elected officials stepped up in ways that I would have never predicted before. But um, in a way, you kind of have to create your own social safety net. And and one way to do that is to save for emergency. So I'm going to stick with some of the bank rate mantras there uh, and uh, and really try to just encourage people to live beneath their means. You know, just because you can afford something doesn't mean you need to pay that much for something. And from that, by having a budget, knowing how much income you have, have you should have a good idea about where your expenses are on an ongoing basis, especially these days that we have these 
smartphones that help us to monitor our accounts and mobile alerts. Um, I think we can, we're in a better position now. I, I do think that in many ways it is a golden age for financial services just because of innovation and technology and the range of different kinds of companies that are out there that want to help people accomplish their financial goals. And obviously in the process, they want to make some money themselves. But I think that that is uh, the basis for a tremendous opportunity and, and opportunity is still very much present in, in these United States of America. Mark, let me ask you three final questions, if I may, Absolutely. to wrap up, kind of rapid fire ones. So the first of three, what are the key daily habits that you have that make you successful and productive? Well, I appreciate the uh, presumption Presupposition. That, that I am those things. Um, I think I think you know I'm not the smartest person, but I do work hard, and and uh, and and I've been very focused uh, since I was a teenager on work. And so I think that if one is focused and try to do the right thing, uh, which does have some religious uh, underpinnings in my own life, uh, you know, I'm a person and, and it's just the, the way that I'm made up is I love talking to everybody who's willing to talk. And so it may be that I'm going to the dry cleaner if a woman isn't. I'm thinking one woman in particular where I had a wonderful conversation about how she came to the United States from South Korea. Uh, I love talking to that person as much as as the CEO and maybe better than the CEO. And so I think it's, you know, having curiosity, being able to work hard. Uh, I made uh, a priority during the pandemic to focus on my physical health. Um, my father passed away early on, not of COVID. That We don't know that he died of COVID because he was in a nursing home. But I, at, I went through a period where I was, uh, you know, dealing with that, mourning that. And I, I basically turned it on myself to say, I've got to focus on my own health because I don't want to repeat the problems that my father had. And so I think trying to focus on your goals, work hard and, and focus on your health. Uh, those are some things uh, that are important. And I would just say, try to treat people well, you know, because it's difficult out there and we can all add a little sunlight into this world. If we just think about, is there one person out there who I can maybe make their day a little better, or at least we can get through it together. Second question. Uh, the, so you've been a journal, you're, you're a career journalist. Yes. What's been the hardest lesson you've learned in your career? Hmm. Uh, it was an early lesson. Uh, and that was, and, and just to frame that just a little bit for you, my dad was a newspaper editor uh, in a small town in Kansas. I sort of did something that he didn't want me to do and went to work for the radio station, uh, which was in our town at the age of 15. And he didn't like the notion of broadcast news or any of that, but uh, but I got my my start that way. And then I went to the University of Kansas and was able to continue to work and have worked ever since. And I remember um, there was a very wise, seasoned broadcast journalism professor who had made his way through Washington, D.C., and then went back to academia. And um, And some of my colleagues in school were giving me a little bit of grief, I think, some of which was because of uh, resentment that I had been working professionally for quite some time. And I remember I went to speak with him and this, this is not necessarily for a full family audience, but, uh, <laughs> but he said, Mark, you know, when I was in Washington, I used to have a plaque on my desk and it said, don't let the bastards get you down. And, and I think what the takeaway from that was that, especially in the, in media, and it's only become worse because of social media. Um, you know, it can it, that can be a very you can become a very easy target for toxicity. And and traditionally, broadcast managers were among the worst with that. They they would just nickel and dime people uh, with um, less than constructive criticism. So you just had to develop a, a tough skin and to be focused and and be willing to accept constructive criticism by all means. Uh, I tend to think that I'm probably my own worst critic anyway. So whatever anybody else has coming my way, I probably already processed that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me ask you one final question. And uh, you actually preempted the one that I usually ask, which is the most important thing that people should be thinking about. And I think you yes. did say the two things that you find people neglect doing, right? Saving for retirement and et cetera, mm -hmm. or for a rainy day. 
So let me ask you, this is a, maybe an easier one, but I don't like being asked this off the cuff myself. I'm going to do it anyway. Okay. Favorite book. I'm always looking for a good book or a good book you can recommend. doesn't need to be, you know, highbrow or anything. No. Like a good, good read. Well, there's, uh, I'm going to mention two. And, and one is one that I read first as a young person, which was the Andrew Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence wow. People. Uh, I felt that that was something that really helped me to embrace the idea of engaging with other people. And then I'm going to talk about one that I learned by virtue of some work I do that's in a similar setting uh, that we are right now for bank rate, because I've been doing an ongoing video series called On the Money. And there's a wonderful writer out there named Brooke Lawry, uh, who goes under the... Uh, Aaron Lowry, I'm sorry, Aaron Lowry, and there's a little bit of a, a nematic thing going on there or a rhyme thing going on there. Aaron Lowry writes a book series on, under the sort of brand of the broke millennial, okay? And she wrote a book in the last year that is about trying to help us all do a better job about talking about money. OK, so the title of the book is The Broke Millennial Talks, I believe, Talks Money. And it is one of the smartest books I've ever read because she talks about how we need to take the uh, negative energy out of these conversations. We need to be able to if, if we're going to come to terms with our own financial challenges, then we need to be able to have intelligent conversations. And, and you know, whether it's by virtue or, or whether it's because we're talking with our colleagues or employer about money, whether we're talking with a family member, whether it's a spouse or a child, uh, whether it's talking about maybe I can't afford that destination wedding that you want me to go to that's going to cost way too much money. Uh, I really loved how Aaron Lowry, the broke millennial, nailed that and uh, would really recommend that because, I, you know, as with all of those who maybe wish that they'd save more money, I think Many people out there would like to be able to have more productive, constructive conversations about personal finances and money. Yeah, it's, uh, it's you know, coming from England, it's almost a taboo subject. You know, people think it's almost taboo, right? But I think it is. In the, I think it has been in the United States as well. And of course, that's the underpinning for a lack of ability mm -hmm. to deal with uh, financial literacy, right? And, and you know, we have a real problem with our elected officials in, in the United States. That's not a political take. It's that they cannot have mature conversations with the electorate about financial issues. You know, we have massively underfunded the Social Security program, for example, and something's going to have to give on that if, if they don't come to terms on a, a, a solution. But that's not even part of the political discussion or dialogue, right? And, and so um, I think that this problem uh, is be best, you know, begins at home in the sense of having intelligent discussions about that. And and as one who lives and works in the Washington, D.C. area, I would I would like for the electorate to have more constructive conversations about money with our elected officials as well. Mark Hamrick, Senior Economic Analyst, Washington Bureau Chief of Bankrate.com. And I'm not going to leave it out. Senior Director, of Red Ventures. <laughs> what an enormous pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me today. Pleasure is all mine. Thanks so much. Those are the best questions I've been asked forever. And, uh, you know, uh, good luck with uh, your efforts and, and, and for those of all your viewers as well. It was a great pleasure. That was Mark Hamrick, Washington Bureau Chief, Senior Economic Analyst at Bankrate.com and Senior Director with Parent Red Ventures. To find out more about Mark, go to the podcast page for today's episode at GowerCrowd.com. And at the top of the page, if you're not already subscribed, go and hit the subscribe button and sign up to our newsletter. It is the only newsletter and news channel at GowerCrowd.com that is exclusively dedicated to real estate crowdfunding and syndication, where you will find a mass of information that you can immediately use from news of what's going on, latest news, what's going on in the industry, to education, to access to every crowdfunded real estate deal on the market today. Subscribe there at GowerCrowd.com. It is totally free. Mark Hamrick, thank you so very much for joining me today. It was an enormous pleasure meeting you, and I look forward to staying in touch. And thank you to our most important listeners out there for joining us today. Here at Gower Crowd, we all really appreciate you joining us. 
spending your time with us to listen to these podcasts. Do hope you find them valuable. And that's it for today. Be well, stay safe, and I'll see you next week. For now, this is Adam Gower signing off.